right. Uh, I'm so glad to have my brother here. You know, uh, many of you know that this last week I was in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, helping to lead uh, an initiative that is called the Black Church Pack. It is a uh, container that myself and a number of faith leaders and bishops from the black church tradition, uh, from mu the music industry, we've all built these containers to help us be able to do political work around addressing gun violence, mass incarceration, voter suppression, and climate change. And uh, because we're a church as a 501c3, we can't do partisan work. Partisan means that we can't endorse candidates as a church. We can't give uh, our, our resources to help pass certain laws. But as individuals, we can participate in uh, doing work through some of these containers. And so um, several years ago, literally uh, right after the election of Donald Trump, I was, because I was planning to take a sabbatical um, you know, after uh, the 2016 election, I had it all planned. I was gonna take about six months off and try to recharge. And I'm sitting there on the couch with my wife and she looked at me after they announced Donald Trump's the president and she just shook her head and said, you ain't taking no sabbatical, are you? And I said, man, how y'all, why y'all do this to me? Just when I thought I was out, you pulled me back in. I mean, it's a Godfather reference, nobody knows Godfather. So a number of us got together those because we all could foresee how troubling the moment was about to get. And, and so for the last several years, we've been working to, to build relationships and raise resources. Our first big victory uh, using uh, the PAC and some of our other uh, uh, voting uh, uh, op operations was in uh, 2017 with the woke vote victory down in Alabama. Some of y'all remember, remember that where we helped to uh, do an upset of the Senate uh, Alabama race and we were able to literally touch about 400,000 voters uh, or at least congregation members through our programs and we helped to get the vote out in a way that just tipped the election uh, towards uh, a candidate who at the very least was not a uh, 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 a pervert, somebody say amen, a, a, a sexual predator, amen. The other one has some other problems, but we at least were realizing, okay, we're gonna have to draw the line somewhere. And, and, and so we've continued to do that work. And so long story short, uh, we had this thought, what would it look like for us to start inviting presidential candidates to come and make their pitch to the voters from our churches long before the presidential candidate is chosen? And so we put this big idea together and we started to call the candidates and the candidates started to say yes. And so we invited seven of the top candidates for the Democratic nomination of the presidency of the United States. Uh, we were trying to invite Donald Trump but we couldn't figure out how to get the invitation to him. And so we're gonna invite him to the next one because I would love to sit on a stage with Donald Trump. Woo, you wanna talk about some must-see TV. Amen, amen. Uh, but um, couldn't do it this time. And so five of the seven candidates came and we got a chance to ask them very direct questions about how they plan to address issues of economic inequality, how they plan to address student loan debt, how they plan to address issues of maternal deaths, disproportionate maternal deaths among black mothers. We talked about immigration policy. We talked about uh, gun violence. We talked about voter suppression. We talked about white nationalist violence. We talked about all of these things in a black church setting to all, all only black church audience, millennials mostly who are more conservative leaning. And I'm telling you, not only was the audience tuned in, we had an earth shattering amount of coverage. Some of you probably have seen it over the last couple days. They told us that we had over 200 press, uh, press hits in the first 12 hours. Uh, Amsterdam news, I mean, people were reporting on what we were talking about all across the country. CNN, of course, all the major networks interrupted their programming to stream what we were doing live. Um, and so it just turned out to be such a great blessing. And I just want to thank God for the team of the way who came and helped me pull all of this off, helped us pull this off. Minister Wayne, Minister Mike Carpenter in the booth, Pastor Tanisha, 
they were there and they, they, they Anton Burrell, uh, we and our, our other team from uh, Live Free and Black Church Pack and Think Rubix and on and on, we did such historic work. Listen, the candidates told us uh, that this was the best experience they've had yet. In the, in, the, in the presidential campaign season. Uh, we had Elizabeth Warren there, Bernie Sanders there, Pete Buttigieg there, Julian Castro there, and Cory Booker. I thought Cory Booker was trying to candidate for a church. He was preaching so hard. Amen. And they just, they were forced to, 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 to bring the text and their values into the conversation. And uh, it proved to be an amazing experience. So I just want to thank all of you for your prayers and your support. Uh, it was quite a Herculean task. Um, I knew I wasn't going to be in a position to preach because I was just going to be so tired. I got home late last night, and I'm still pretty sleep deprived. I think I've been operating on three hours of sleep uh, uh, a night for the whole week. Uh, and so I just, in advance, asked my brother to come preach because I knew uh, he, you'd probably get a better word than what I was going to give you. Amen. Even at 100%. Somebody say amen. And so I'm so glad to have the spokesman for the King of Glory. He is no stranger to the way, church. Come on, stand to your feet, everybody. And let's welcome Pastor Ben McBride to the podium. Amen. Amen. Now let's put our hands together for the one who really matters. Let's give God some praise. God is the one who matters. God is the one who matters. Amen. Go ahead and take your seats. The presence of the Lord is good to be here, to be back with family and friends, and um, I'm, I'm so proud of my brother, proud, proud of, of, of all the work that he's doing, and, um, and I know that it, it comes at a great cost. So can y'all just take maybe 30 seconds, stand on your feet, and just let's give him some love and appreciation. Yes. All right. And then one more thing that I'm going to ask you to do, and this actually doesn't require any noise, don't call him for a week. Amen. I can say that because I'm his brother, praise God, right? Let's give him a little space so he can get some oxygen in his, in his he didn't pay me to say it, but... Uh, if y'all mad, you can send me a letter. I won't read it, amen, but you know, you can send it anyway, amen. But we, we thank God for uh, being here today. I'm not gonna be before us long. Um, this has been a powerful Sunday of, of the Peacemaker Sabbath and us thinking about all of our families. Let's give all of our families and those of us that have been impacted by gun violence one more encouragement. Amen. We, we stand with you, we are with you, um, and we're gonna keep pushing along as God would give us the strength so that we can all keep joining God in the world that God is making. Uh, let me just say a word of prayer. God, we wanna say thank you again for all that you've done for us. If it hadn't been for you who was on our side, we would have been swallowed up by our enemies, but we are thankful to you who has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, we ask for these few moments, Lord, uh, remove my own thoughts and my agenda. Lord, bring the word, the comfort, the encouragement, the inspiration, the enlightenment that we all need to hear in our own different ways. May we catch 60 seconds from you that gives us some strength, a nugget to help us be able to make a step, be better, be greater, have more faith, have more courage, to step forward in who you're calling us to be. Lord, help us to lean into you, not into anybody else's frame, but into your frame. Help us to follow you, not anybody else, but to follow you. If you'll give us that power, Lord, we will give your name praise. We'll give your name glory and honor. We say all this in Jesus' name. Everyone say amen. amen. Come on, say amen again. Amen. I'm going to be talking to us today from the topic, Be Well. Look at the person next to you and say, neighbor. Be well. Look at somebody else and say, neighbor, be well. Look at the person behind you and say, neighbor. Now, that normally doesn't work, but, you know, 
I've been doing that for 20 years and everybody still turns around. So, you know, when you get a good joke, you just don't let it go, right? So um, we want to be well. I'm going to read in the gospel according to John. It'll come up on, on the screen or you can pull up on your phone. Um, this little narrative and story that I just want to draw a couple principles out of. After this, there was a festival of the Jews. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there's a pool called in Hebrew Bethsaida, which has five porticos. In these lay many uh, invalids. In this language, we would call them differently abled people, the blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. Somebody say 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, somebody say a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I don't have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, stand up, take your mat and walk. At once the man was made well and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been cured, it is the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered them, the man who made me well said to me, take up your mat and walk. They asked him, well, who is the man that said to you, take it up and walk? Now, the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had disappeared in the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. Somebody say, be well. Be you know, our country's in a very curious moment, as has been talked about. I don't have to flush all of this out the way that I was. Y'all know what time it is, right? We in a crazy situation right now. It's crazy in the White House. It's, it's crazy in the, in the crack house. It's crazy on the concrete. The police is crazy. It's crazy everywhere, right? And a lot of us are dealing with that anxiety of everything that's going on right now. And, and, and trying to figure out if you're like me or if I'm like you, like how do I find myself in this moment? What's the invitation for me? Where, where, where and how is it that we respond? And yet, as has been talked about up here, for many of us um, and, and a lot of us, we've been struggling and suffering under some hellish conditions for a long time. Right. And, and people have been sitting underneath this pain. And I think one of the challenges that we all find ourselves faced with is that living in conditions like these has it has a tendency to get inside you. I, I remember when I first started getting engaged with the gun violence work and I was talking with one of the, the loved ones and he told me, he said, listen, man, I appreciate all this, all this huggy and warm feelings that you're trying to talk to me about. But real talk, you either predator or prey. You either predator or prey. So, you know, either I'm, I'm going to get somebody or I'm getting got, if you caught that, that colloquialism. Amen, right? And so we get in this, in this dynamic where we're trying to find ways to pull our world closer to the world that God wants it to be, and yet we're fighting with some of the same uh, uh, influences that have found their way into us. What, what, what I mean is, is that we want to stop violence and yet we, a lot of us, have been socialized that the only way that I can really win is to be violent myself. Maybe you're not being violent with a gun, but you're being violent with language. We're being violent with, with, with social media. We're being violent in a passive aggressive way. You know what I'm saying? By the way in which we are either creating space or eliminating space. And really at the heart, what I found from working with loved ones over the last eight, nine years that we're involved in violence, at the heart of that is trying to figure out how can I be well? If I don't know how to be well outside of using violence, then I use violence to try to be well. And so a lot of times when we think about what does it mean to be a peacemaker and what does it mean for us to change the world, sometimes our first mind goes to outreach. 
and it should. We need to, as uh, Pastor Mike was saying, we need to call our senators. We need to make sure that these strategies are getting funded in the way in which they should because we know that it costs a lot less to actually save someone's life through these strategies rather than invest in prisons and police and locking our loved ones away. So we need to do that outreach. We also need to do some inreach. Look at the person next to you and say, do some inreach. Because how many know that for some of us, Ben McBride at the head of the line, the enemy is in a me. And I'm trying to figure out how to deal with this violent person on the inside that when I don't feel like I can get my way, I want to figure out how to operate from a place of insecurity and how to get, grab power and maintain power even when that means the, 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 the um, dishonoring of God's creation. We're in this moment where, you know, a lot of us are like, well, you know, progressives or conservatives, which way it is that you want to go. You know, they did a study. The Lethal Mass Partnership um, did a study. Y'all go to this, this next slide. They, they did a study where they asked people if they believe we'd be better off in the country if a large number of the opposing party just died. Now, conservatives, 16% of them, 8 million voters said the country would be better, one out of six people, if the majority of the progressives just died. But one out of five progressives, <laughs> close to 9 million, said the country would just be better if the conservatives just die. I want to just let you take a moment and just take that in. That whether the political ideology is on the left or the right, we have begun to be possessed with violence. To believe that violence is the way that we will get to wellness. That if people believe different than me and see the world different than me and, and, and are doing things that are actively creating harm and pain and trauma for folks, I, I think the planet would just be better if they just died. And then we come into church and sing songs to the Prince of Peace. Whoo, that's a whole nother message, right? We can see the craziness in the white evangelicals, but we also got to be making sure that we can see it if it is living in us. So then, as the, the writer says in 3 John 1, 2, he says, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health just as it is well with your soul. That we want to make the world more well, but we need to get well while the world is getting well. There is no fix with the world getting well and we remain sick. I believe the Spirit of God, while God is reconciling the world, is also seeking to reconcile us, to get the violence out of us, to get the pain out of us, so that we don't just become people who can talk about the world that should be, but we actually can be the people who can live in the world that should be. So the first thing I want to talk about is location. Somebody say location. I'm about to go fast, too, because I'm, I'm standing in between you and lunch, amen, and I'm not, y'all ain't hit me with no rock, amen. Some, some of y'all didn't like the slide I just showed, and I saw some of y'all was twitching, to, and praise God, amen. So, everybody say location. In, in this story, here we have, I'm going to get there quick, we have this, this differently abled person who is here at the pool of Bethesda. Scripture and story says that he's been ill for 38 years. Somebody say 38 years. That's longer than some of us been alive. 38 years, and, and it says that Jesus saw that the man had been at this place a long time, right? That, that the, the sick and those who were infirmed were brought to this um, pool, and it was believed that an angel would come down into the water, would stir up the water, and that whoever got into the water first would get healed. And so this man had been sitting. Can you imagine? And some of us can. I know I can. Can you imagine living in a condition 
for 38 years. And then end up spending the majority of your time in a certain location because of an illness that you have for 38 years. The reason I want to talk to us about location, it's important because when you have struggled, at times our situation can determine our location, and if we're not careful, that location becomes our identification. Or you end up having a struggle that you're going through that, and a trauma that you have experienced that then becomes uh, uh, where you camp out for the rest of your life, which then becomes how you see yourself. And when Jesus steps up to this man, Jesus begins to encounter him and want to invite him into a different way of being. But this man was very stuck in the reality where he had been for 38 years. Where have you been for a long time that God's trying to get you out of? What mindset you've been rocking with that God's trying to get you out of? What stories you've been telling yourself that you've been justifying for a long time that God's trying to get you out of? Somebody say 38 years. You can see it in the man, but you can't see it in yourself. And everybody around you is watching you camped out at the pool. 38 years. And God is saying to us in Isaiah 43, behold, I will do a new thing. God is saying, stop remembering the things of old. I'm trying to do something new. But sometimes that situation gets in our location. That location becomes our identification. I was working with the loved ones who were involved in some of the gun violence. And, and, and you know, one of my little aha moments for me personally around getting involved and recognizing God was calling me to become a peacemaker started in this building. Back when the, con when the church was still facing this way. And, and I had moved into East Oakland, what they were called the kill zone at that time, where the majority of the homicides happened. And moved in there with my wife and three daughters. Whole story of how I got Janelle and them girls to move in there is a whole nother message. Amen. You have to come back for part two for that, right? But in any case, I'm sitting over here. And at that time, my, my situation, because we grew up in such a kind of rigid, you know, kind of holiness structure, to me, you know, the way to, to stop violence was just to get everybody to become Christian. That's how we were going to stop violence. So that was what I wanted to give my, all of my time and energy to. And I was sitting over there when the altar was still here, and I was talking to my brother. And I told this story all over the place. Uh, I was sitting there with my brother, and, and I was telling him, I said, man, you know, we just need to get everybody saved. There's demons out here. That's what's causing the violence. It's demons. We just need to get everybody saved. And Mike looked at me and said, you can't save nobody that's dead, man. I remember I had a moment. I said, well, he's right. Even though my own situation had become my location, my religiosity had become my identification that actually, although I had a heart to want to stop violence, my own orientation around that was keeping me from the very thing that God was trying to invite me into. Your location, if you're not careful, can become your identification. I was working with some of the loved ones, and, and I invited them down to my building when I was running an a, a, a organization downtown Oakland. And I invited them in, and I, I told my staff, I said, set up the room the way we set it up for the donors when we're trying to, you know, raise all this money. So, you know, throw out and put this old nice spread. I said, throw it out there, and we're going to invite the loved ones to come. So I had a few brothers that came down, and they, you know, they all came in. They got their pistols, et cetera, et cetera. And we've been in deep conversation with them around trying to stop the violence. So I come up the stairs. They're waiting in the lobby. And I said, y'all just go in that room right there, and, and we're going to meet in there. So one of the brothers, he walked in. He opened the door. As he walked in the door, he looked in, and he said, oh, ish, and jumped out. I didn't say it. I said, ish, yeah, y'all, just so y'all can catch that, right? And he jumped out and closed the door. And he looked at me, he said, who this for? I said, that's for y'all. He said, this for us. I said, that's for y'all. And he walked in and sat down. And I said, y'all come on in, let's eat dinner. And he sat there for about five to 10 minutes and he kept self-soothing, like rubbing his, 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 his uh, thighs and rubbing his arms. And what I saw in that moment is that our brother had been dishonored so much that when we created a space of honor, his body physically pulled him out of the space. 
that for him, this place of honor was not where he belonged. You see, the, the, the realities of the way in which systems and structures and, and sometimes in our own lives can get us to identify with the wrong things, that we will get locked into places of violence that keep us from the very invitation into honor that God's trying to give us. So we need to be aware of the ways in which God is trying to invite us away from our location. Jesus says to this man, right? He comes up to the man, he says, one question, do you want to be made well? You know what the man starts telling him? Well, I can't be well because, you know, there's an angel that comes down and everybody else has got help to get people in the water and I don't have nobody to help me get in the water. So that's the reason I've been sitting here for the last 38 years is because nobody's here to be able to help me do what everybody else has got some help to do and, and, and nobody's here. That has nothing to do with what Jesus asked him. <laughs> Jesus didn't ask him, why are you sitting here on the side? Jesus didn't ask him why you've been here 38 years. He asked him, do you want to be made well? We got to be careful. There's things that I've, I am working with in my own life that sometimes we can get so connected to a way that we've been. That even when the spirit is trying to come and invite us into wellness, we have lost the ability to have that conversation. We telling God all the reasons why we can't be well. Then coming down to the altar and talking about, Lord, make me well. Then go home, well, I can't be well because of this, and I can't be well because of that, and I can't be well because of this, and I can't be well from that. But the Spirit is saying, do you want to be made well? What do you want? And I think we've got to start doing some investigation into ourselves around what is it that God, that is holding me back from accepting my wellness. What are the ways in which I've gotten caught up in my life, in my practice, in my, in my situation that I am not ready to answer that question from God? Do you want to be made well? I think this country doesn't even know how to answer this question. Which is why we keep having all of the gun violence in our streets. When, when, and it cracks, well, don't crack me up, but it, it breaks my heart. When I see on the news and, and there's a mass shooting and they say, this is not supposed to happen here. I said, well, where is it supposed to happen? But what it denotes is that people have already said in their brain, this kind of violence and pain belongs in certain places with certain people and it does not belong with me. So that is a sickness within themselves that they need to do some investigation about to figure out how they get made well. This is why we need to have peacemakers and prophetic voices who are willing to walk around in life and ask the hard questions. America, when are you going to decide to be made well? When are you going to make the choice to actually do some reconciliation in your life? I like the way Dick Gregory said it. He said, America is like a homeless person that's been sleeping on the street that just puts on a tuxedo and then comes in and is trying to figure out who's not smelling so fresh. And Dick Gregory said to America, it's you because you refuse to take a shower. I don't know how I got all on that. But <laughs> you know the video I'm talking about. America need some people to invite it into wellness. And Frederick Douglass said that power concedes nothing without a demand. So we need to be people as peacemakers who are both stopping violence but also calling this country onto account to be made well. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the peacemakers. Somebody say peacemakers. For they will be called the children of God. He don't say peacekeepers. Peacekeepers means, you look it up in a dictionary, people who are preserving the peace, people who are maintaining the status quo. Jesus don't say blessed are the peacekeepers. He says blessed are the peacemakers. What does it mean to be a peacemaker? It means one who inserts themselves into obvious conflict for the purpose of reconciliation. Now, 
You can't be inserting yourself into conflict if you yourself are the conflict, right? Jesus says, before you try to go get a splinter out of somebody else's eye, get the two by four out of your own eye so you can see clearly. That's why we got to be well. I love the movement, but we got so much toxicity in the movement because don't nobody want to be well. Everybody just want to be right. All right, that's, that's not the place for that sermon, but I'll just... As you can see, I just needed to get that out. Amen. Right? We don't need to be right. We need to be well. You cannot invite the world or anybody into a place you yourself have not gone. How can we invite the world into peace if we're not going to allow peace to get in our hearts? How are we going to invite the world into wellness if we're not going to allow wellness in our hearts? Somebody say peacemakers. Being a part of peace means I love the scripture after this, that, that you're going to be peacemakers. He also says, blessed are those who are persecuted. When we get persecuted, we feel like that's the bad thing. I don't like it. It's not normal to like it. But that is the role and the part and parcel of what it means to be a peacemaker. People love for you to say what they agree with. Ain't nobody trying to hear you say something they don't agree with. So when you persecute it, not, not for being... You know what I'm saying? Being on some fugazi stuff. You know what I'm saying? Uh, or, or, or doing wrong when you persecute it for righteousness sake. Right? That we, we should be aware that when people say false things against you and all of that, for Christ's sake, we can take joy. That we must lean into this culture of peace. We got to do some investigation to figure out what's holding us back. Because we must be the people that are walking around to create violence. I want to say this. We must, as peacemakers, be people who imagine a future that includes your enemies, even though they are manifesting a present that doesn't include you. I'm going to say it again. As peacemakers, we must be able to imagine a future that includes your enemies even though they are manifesting a present that does not include you. That's what it means to be a peacemaker. Sit with, with loved ones. So I'm going to kill that dude. I'm going to sit there in this conversation with them, and, and when I say that, that jars some of us. Like, man, why would he want to kill that dude? I sat with loved ones and said, man, I don't care who it is. I'm going to kill him, his grandmama, his baby. I don't care. I'm going to kill all of them. I don't care. And that's jarring, because he's like, I'm going to live. But we ourselves in the political world and some of these other worlds do the same thing. They're my enemy. I'm going to destroy them. When Jesus says, love your enemies. Amen. Jesus said, love your enemies. Amen. Not Ben McBride, not Barack Obama, not whoever else is talking. Jesus said, Amen. love your enemies. Amen. Pray for them who despitefully use you. This is the gospel, though. I mean, ain't no way we, we can worship Christ and not follow Christ. Matter of fact, all right, and then I'm going to get off this. Jesus ain't really just asked you a whole bunch to worship him. He asked you to follow him. He said, how can you say you're my disciple if you don't do what I say? All right, I'm off my soapbox. I love y'all. Don't, don't look mean at me. I love y'all, for real. I'm struggling through this myself, right? But I don't want to be like the, the 1960s and 70s sci sci-fi uh, filmmakers. You know, I like science fiction, and, and I could tell there were some racist folks making these movies because in the future, there's never no black people. I said, man, these people tough. They don't even see us in the future. <laughs> We just gone like the dinosaurs. We just got hit by a meteorite. It just, it was a black meteorite. It just killed all the black people, right? Just, it's a tough world, boy. That's why I'm so glad for Black Panther and Afro-punk fusionist, Afro-futurism. Somebody show me that, that I'm alive in a couple hundred years. All right, that's, that's off the point, too, but... Everybody say investigation. 
do that investigation and figure out what's happening because we must be watching for the Spirit's invitation. In the, as I close this story, this man is there and, and, and he tells Jesus all the reasons why. And Jesus tells him, stand up, take up your mat, and walk. Jesus says, there's nothing that denotes to us in the story that the man was lame by legs. Because it says this notion of him being able to get to the water. There's an assumption that maybe that that's the case. But we don't know exactly what was wrong with the man. But Jesus tells the man, stand up. Get up from here. Take up what's been making you comfortable in this place and leave. I believe that the, the spirit is giving us invitation. Somebody say invitation. That to be a peacemaker and to be well, it's time to get up from where we've been. Wherever it is you've been camped at, the Spirit is saying, get up and pick up, not all this beautiful altar work, but pick up the things that have allowed you to be comfortable in a place where you've been and walk. Leave the place that you've been that I am inviting you into a new and different place. Change your conditions. You know, there's, there's, when, when, when we were doing some of the work with some of the, the young brothers, and I remember there was a day, and one of the, the young brothers came to my office and brought me these. Brought me a bunch of these, these bullets. Now, I don't know guns, so I don't even know what kind of cow. I just know they big. What is these? To something. But I remember he came and he said, he had a whole box of all this stuff. And he said, listen, I'm giving this to you, big bro. I just want to live. <laughs> what that said to me in that moment, though, was it wasn't just about him in his place saying, I, I want something different. But it was also him taking the action to taking the things that had kept him stuck in his position. And coming and ridding himself of the things that had kept him stuck in the place he didn't want to be. What I want to say to us, beloved, is we must be taking the invitation of the Spirit to loose the, ourselves from the things that have held us where we are. Recognizing that we got loved ones in the community who are trying to get loose from the things that are holding them stuck. But if we don't get loose, we can't help them get loose. And so God wants all of us. To be in the practice, as the scripture says, to lay aside every weight. Somebody say every weight. Lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. And let us run this race with patience, with perseverance that has been set for us. This man left as I close this story and say this. This man left and he's walking around now with his mat, living into his healing. And the people, the, the religious folks, you know what they're concerned about? You broke the religious rules. You ain't supposed to carry your mat on Sunday. You ain't supposed to talk like that if you saved. You ain't supposed to walk like that if you save. You ain't supposed to post like that on Facebook if you save. All these religious rules, people got to hold on to power. That's what they upset about with this man walking around. But I love that Jesus found a man. And Jesus told him, stop sinning so nothing worse happens to you. The more I've thought about that, and this is just my interpretation, pull, pulling from Mike's theological words. This is my eisegesis, and it's not no exegesis, right? Now. <laughs> but from my interpretation, one of the things I wonder that maybe the sin that Jesus is talking about was talking about with that man was stop seeing yourself as how everybody else has seen you sitting at that pool. Stop seeing yourself as less than how I see you. Stop viewing, stop, stop living in the confines of your own mental prison and get up, stand up, change your condition and walk into my destiny for you.
So I believe God's word to you no matter where you are today. Get up from where you are. If you stuck in some depression today, get up from where you are. If you stuck in some financial struggle today, get up from where you are. If you've been stuck in being overwhelmed, get up from where you are. Take up your mat and let's walk together. We might have to limp a little bit. I might have to lean on you and you might have to lean on me. But let's put one foot ahead of the other and let's walk into our healing. Stand on your feet, everyone. God wants us to change our location, do some investigation, and respond to God's invitation. We don't have to remain stuck at the pool of Bethesda. I don't know about you, but I want to be able to answer this question in my life. As the Lord keeps asking me, Ben, do you want to be made well? You want to be made well from the hurt, from the pain, from the disillusionment? You want to be made well from all the trauma that you've taken in? Do you really want to be made into an instrument of peace? Can't lead nobody no place you yourself have not gone. So God says, surrender to me. I'll take off your spirit of heaviness and give you a garment of praise. God wants us to be well in our hearts, in our spirits, in our bodies so that we can be peacemakers that join God in making the world anew. No matter how busy you might be, I want to tell you, God is waiting for you to step into who he's calling you to be. You have everything that you need right now to be who God is calling you to be. It might be in seed form, but in every seed is a tree. In every seed is a tree. So as the scripture says, despise not the day of small beginnings. May it start this week that God uses you to be a peacemaker. And maybe that first act of peacemaking is about in reach. It's about allowing God to come and make peace in your soul. If you've been overwhelmed by struggle and disappointment and pain, I don't want y'all to hear the comment I just made a, a minute ago around just standing up out of depression. Depression's a real thing. And so if you're really struggling with depression, I want to invite some space as you also think about exploring mental health support to also invite the spirit to come in and make peace in your soul. You don't have to have one without the other. But would you just close your eyes? Just do, do some hard work for a minute. Just invite the spirit to come and make peace in your heart. If you don't mind, would you just raise your hands? Just as Minister Lauren just sings that over you, just raise your hands and receive that. I believe you are all I believe. I believe that you're my portion. I believe you're more. Lord, we ask right now with your hands lifted, you know every heart. Lord, as we've prayed today, Lord, we pray right now that you would come and comfort the hearts of those of us, Lord, who have been impacted by gun violence and police violence and trauma and pain. Those of us, Lord, who miss our loved ones, who have struggled through these hard moments in life. Lord, we pray right now that you come and make peace in our hearts. Lord, would you come and help our hearts to be a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone. 
Lord, would you give us, Lord, the healing that we need that gives birth to redemption and reconciliation and mercy and forgiveness. Lord, do a work in our hearts. And Lord, for those of us who are feeling overwhelmed by the violence of white supremacy running through the land and seeing the manifestation of violence just in Portland yesterday, Lord, white supremacists marching through the streets declaring their hatred. Lord, the way in which that brings so much anxiety and frustration and trauma to many of us, God, we pray, would you come and minister to our hearts peace, the kind of peace that gives us power to stand up against injustice, but the kind of peace that also enables our hearts to still be formed by your redemptive mercy. Lord, we need you to do a work in us that we can't do in ourselves. Lord, we don't even know exactly who it is that we need to be moving forward, but we want to say yes to who you're calling us to be. So God, would you help us, Lord, wherever, whatever pools we are sitting at in our lives. Lord, as your spirit is coming along, give us the strength to not deny you. Give us the strength to not avoid you. And Lord, when you invite us to get up from the place we've been, Lord, would your spirit give us the strength in our spirit, in our mind, and in our heart to stand up into the destiny that you are calling forth from us. It will only be at your word. And it'll only be at your time that we will be able to do what it is that you are calling us to do. Now, God, I ask right now that a wave of peace comes through this whole building. Peace in our minds, peace in our hearts. Make us instruments of peace. Make us vessels of honor. Make us vessels of mercy. Make us vessels of grace. Give us the power to make the circle of human concern wider so that more of God's children and more of God's creations can belong. Lord, we need you. Open us. And Lord, we will say yes. Now grab the hands of the person next to you. As I close, let's make a love chain all around the room. I want you to squeeze their hand right now. Squeeze it tight. We squeeze into our neighbor's hand a fresh anointing and move of the spirit. We squeeze into our neighbor's hand a fresh touch. We squeeze into our neighbor's hand faith and courage. We squeeze into our neighbor's hand possibility and power. Come on, squeeze their hand tight. We act right now and squeeze into our neighbor's hand the potential of them to show up in this world not as a shadow of who you've called them to be, but as a full version of who you've called them to be. 110%. We squeeze it into their hands right now. And if you believe that God is birthing you to be a peacemaker, put your hands together and let's give God some praise in this place. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Hallelujah!